That's why it's funny. Yeah. 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 The inquiry is resumed. Ms. Davis, you have a short statement. I do, sir. I just have a copy for you. I'll send it to your case. Thanks very much. Thank you. And I'm not sure whether you heard that Mr. Baxter, I think he's actually also back in the room, asked whether he could speak um, before 2 p.m. Um, that should be fine. Yeah. You yeah. can speak directly after yourself, Mr. Baxter. Thank you, thank you sir. This is the opening statement of Westminster City Council in this inquiry relating to the application to the Planning Commission for the redevelopment of the MMS Flagship Street on Oxford Street. You, sir, have identified the main issues for consideration and for the briefing set those out. I will return to those. Moving to paragraph three, then. The professional officers of the council authored a report on the application, and in line with officer recommendation, the Planning Application Subcommittee. Resolved to grant permission for the scheme subject to conditions, except for 106 agreements and the GLA stage two approval, which in the proposed um, then confirmed on the 7th of March, and that strategic issues raised at the consultation stage have been adequately addressed. Oxford Street is an international retail destination, and overall, the proposed development will help to facilitate the delivery of renewal and improvements to the Oxford Street district, which is a key corporate objective of the council. The vision for Oxford Street not only supports the traditional shopping experience, but also invites developers to diversify into other areas consistent with the national drive to reimagine High Street. And the proposed development does exactly that. It will support a vibrant West End and bring a new experiential retail store with the, with the delivery of over 45,000 square meters. I'm sorry, sir, I don't know how to move that. Um, there is substantial agreement between the council and MS on these matters, and the main issues for determination at this call in stage largely concern the issues raised by SAVE. They predominantly relate to firstly heritage and associated landscape impact, and secondly sustainability matters. Accordingly, we will deal briefly with the council's case on those two issues below. Firstly, then, heritage. The statement of case sets out the, the council's analysis of the heritage and associated impact of the proposed development. And it's common ground that none of the existing buildings on the site are statutory listed. However, the site is close to several listed buildings, conservation areas, and partly within the Portman Estate Conservation Area and registered park and gardens. With that in mind, the heritage case can be distilled to three key aspects. These are the impact on the setting of listed buildings, including selfridges. The setting of the structure place conservation area, the setting of the Portman um, estate conservation area, and the setting of the Mayfair, the setting of the Mayfair conservation area. And there are several key points to make. First, the primary consequence of the redevelopment is the change to the age and appearance of the buildings on the site, and how these affect the Sorry, setting I'm, I'm and the, the significance. First, the primary consequence of the redevelopment is the change to the age and appearance of the buildings on the site and how these affect the setting and ultimately the significance of the Selfridges. Whilst Orchard House has an affinity with Selfridges, it is merely the facades of Orchard House that are of more historic and architectural interest than the rest of the site. The Council recognises that the facades do have a limited importance in terms of their contribution to the setting, but do not greatly aid the understanding of how significant the design of Selfridges was at the time of its construction. The facades do not represent a particularly good example of the type of commercial architecture Selfridges may have subsequently influenced, and other buildings in Oxford Street contemporaneous with Orchard House better reflect the move from a vertical classicism to Art Deco than Orchard House does, for example, to Hallworth's in the Collingsworth building. Second, 
the impact on proximate conservation areas is also considered to be acceptable. In ground level views along Oxford Street, including those in the Stratford Place conservation area, the proposed route plan will be clearly delineated by the strong design timber canopy. This is harmonious with historic and robust on its strong um, line of selfages and also with the development of that part of Oxford Street, including the buildings towards Marble Arch, which are in the Portman Estate Conservation Area, North of Oxford Street, and the Mayfair Conservation Area to the south. Similarly, from Granville Place, Portman View South, and the other streets to the west of the site, the increased massing will be obvious. However, as proposed, the change is not in itself harmful in heritage terms, because it occurs in the context of other similarly large scale development. With regard to the impact on the Mayfair conservation area <laughs> to and from it, its setting is defined by large-scale commercial buildings in Oxford Street. The proposed development is of an equivalent height and scale to other developments in Oxford Street and does not harm the setting of that conservation area either. Third, the retention of Orchard House would only serve to retain the undesirable characteristics of the building's obsolete internal planning. Whilst it demonstrates the application of planning principles at the time of its construction, it was designed as a much smaller commercial operation. It is now unsuitable for the retail offer at the flagship MS store. Ultimately, the council concluded that the proposed development accords with City Plan Policy 39, and in particular, part B of that policy, which requires that development must optimise the positive role of the historic environment, but in Westminster's townscape, economy and sustainability. Finally, the route that permeates the proposed development from Orchard Street to Granville Place at the entrance to Portland New South from Oxford Street will also be enhanced. At the rear of the site there will be substantial improvements in the public realm where the undesirable public services area will be swept away in favour of greatly improved streetscape with added frontages. A return reminiscent of the arcade will create a modern interpretation of the beginnings of MS in the Penny Bazaar in Leeds. Put simply, the council recognises that the site comprising three commercial buildings which were progressively adapted over the course of the 20th century to meet the changing retail needs are no longer fit for purpose. The council has had regard to the heritage implications of the development and has found that the improvements to the site as a whole, including the delivery of the substantial public benefits, outweigh the less than substantial harm caused by the loss of the Orchard House facades. Moving on to the second issue, which is sustainability. Since the application was considered by the committee, SAVE objected to the proposed development through Mr Sturgis's report, which was sent to the GLA. This objection was then addressed by the GLA directly in the addendum stage two report, and the conclusion reached by the GLA is one with which the council concurs. The options for a heavy refurbishment, retaining the facades of Orchard House, were explored, but not considered feasible as the embodied carbon saving would have been immaterial. There would be lower operational energy performance when compared to a new build. A light touch refurb was also considered, focusing on a minimal repairs to the internal fabric, limited building services interventions and new internal partitions and finishes, retaining the existing basement. This would require refurbishment every five to ten years over a 60 year period, and that would be less efficient than a new build over the same period. This is owing to the need for repeated refurbishment, maintenance and the poor operational energy performance of the building. Policy SI2 of the London Plan deals with minimising greenhouse gases. It requires that major development should be net zero carbon, and where it is clearly demonstrated that the zero carbon cannot be fully achieved on site, then any shortfall should be provided through a cash in lieu contribution, and such a contribution has been secured in this case. Policy SI7 supports the reduction of waste and the circular economy, and the whole life cycle assessment and the detailed circular economy statement were considered by the GLA with respect to the retrofitting options. Neither policy SI2 nor policy SI7 prohibit demolition, and the GLA was satisfied that the applicant had given sufficient consideration to retrofit and refurb. In, in this instance, the GLA was content that the buildings could be demolished, therefore. In addition, GLA officers have worked actively with 
the council and with the applicant to address matters raised at the consultation stage, namely relating to energy strategy, the circular economy and the WLCA. These have been satisfactorily resolved and the requisite post-construction monitoring requirements have also been appropriately secured. Carbon reduction and urban green that exceeds the target prescribed have also been factored in. And for these reasons, the council's view that the proposed development is acceptable in planning terms. As indicated in the pre inquiry meeting, sir, the council does not intend to present further evidence on any of the issues raised. However, council officers will be content to address matters on which the so require further clarification, either in writing or in a short timetable session, should that be deemed necessary. In all other respects, the council's evidence is that which has been submitted by the yeah. state of the case. And the material that is appended there too. In due course, you, sir, will be respectfully invited to positively recommend the schemes for the Secretary of State to duly adopt such a recommendation and to our planning commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. President. Thank you so much. Let's ask Mr. Oakley to circulate copies of the opening. So these are the opening submissions by Save Britain's Heritage. Marks and Spencer PLC seek planning permission to demolish their existing store at 456472 Oxford Street and build a new 10-storey building with a mixed use for retail, cafe, restaurant, offices, gym and pedestrian arcade. Save Britain's Heritage, or SAVE, object to the planning application because of, firstly, the effect of the proposals on the significance of heritage assets, and secondly, the effect of the proposals on the UK's transition to a zero-carbon economy. SAVE wrote to the Secretary of State on the 18th of May 2022 requesting that he call the application in for his own determination under Section 77 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. The Secretary of State exercised his call-in power on the 20th of June 2022. Stave is a small independent charity whose purpose is to campaign to protect threatened historic buildings and encourage the sustainable reuse of buildings. They have been operating since 1975. Due to the high volume of requests for assistance in relation to planning applications and the charity's limited resources, they are only able to take on a small number of cases as major campaigns. They are highly selective about cases they are able to pursue as a public inquiry. Starting with the effect of the proposals on the significance of heritage assets, part of the existing MS store proposed for demolition is Orchard House, which is a non-designated heritage asset. Demolition of Orchard House and the erection of the proposed new building will result in the total loss of the heritage asset, and it will be Save's case. This will also cause less than substantial harm to the significance of a number of designated heritage assets. The Secretary of State is required to have special regard to the desirability of preserving a listed building or its setting and any harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset is to be given considerable importance and weight. Further, a finding of harm to the setting of a listed building or to a conservation area gives rise to a strong presumption against planning permission being granted. Orchard Street was completed in 1930. It was extended to the north 23 to 24 of Orchard Street in 1968 to 1970 and west. Neil House, 1986. It possesses considerable architectural and historic interest, both in its own right and equally importantly because of its relationship with Selfridges, a grade two star listed building immediately to its east. The positive contribution to the setting of Selfridges and the strong group value owing to stylistic similarities is recognised by Historic England in their comments on the planning application. MS will emphasise the unsuccessful attempt by the 20th Century Society to get the building listed, 
But as Mr. Fordhaw will explain, the failure to meet Historic England's exacting criteria does not mean that Orchard House is not of considerable heritage significance and interest. Although not in a conservation area itself, Orchard House is in the setting of a number of listed buildings and conservation areas, all, all assessed of high, sorry, moderate, high or high significance by Mr. Portrell. The significant impact of both the demolition and the new building be considered in the evidence of Mr. Portrell to this inquiry. They will explain to the inquiry that the heritage impacts have been considerably underestimated by MS and are not outweighed by the public benefits of the scheme. Secondly, the effect of the proposals on the UK's transition to a net zero, a net carbon economy. There is another very significant impact quite apart from the heritage harm. The initial upfront embodied carbon expenditure arising from the construction of the new buildings is nearly 40,000 metric tonnes of CO2, i.e. 40 million kilograms, the equivalent of driving a typical car 99 million miles further than the distance to the sun. Added to this will be a further CO2 cost from the demolition of the existing buildings, amounting to 1,860,797 kilograms. Such a significant embodied carbon cost could have been avoided and could still be avoided if MS seriously and creatively considered the option of refurbishing the buildings, as the evidence of Mr. Sturgis will explain. A comprehensive retrofit of the buildings would, firstly, introduce greater operational energy efficiency in the buildings, secondly, avoid the large embodied carbon emissions of the demolition and rebuild. Thirdly, achieve the desired improvements in terms of providing high quality retail and office space together with new public realm. And finally, avoid the harmful heritage impacts of the proposed new build scheme. And yet, despite the win-win outcome of a deep retrofit, keeping the carbon cost as low as possible has never been a key objective or priority for MNS. Initial feasibility studies in 2018 focused on whether there was sufficient heritage merit in retaining the buildings and on the objective of producing new retail and office space of the highest quality to try and counteract declining sales and a poor performance. One can sympathise with MS for wanting a brand new building and releasing the commercial value that this would bring. However, the decision to proceed with a new build without considering a comprehensive retrofit option like that proposed by Mr. Sturgis was made in 2018 to early 2019, and it has never been revisited. Since then, climate <coughs> legislation and regional local planning policy has caught up with the terrifying reality of the global climate emergency. The concentration of greenhouse gases has been rising steadily and with it mean global temperatures since the start of the Industrial Revolution. The most abundant greenhouse gas, counting for at least two thirds of all greenhouse gases, is CO2, which is largely the product of burning fossil fuels. As the Divisional Court stated in the Crown on the application of Spurrier against the Secretary of State for Transport, the increase in global temperature has resulted in, amongst other things, sea level change, a decline in glaciers, the Antarctic ice sheet and Arctic sea ice, alterations to various ecosystems, and in some areas, a threat to food and water supplies. Emphasising these words, it is potentially catastrophic. If there is anyone in this room who does not find this completely frightening, and they are either not listening or they don't understand it, it is not an understatement to say that the survival of the human race is at stake if we do not all play our part in addressing the climate emergency. Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, ratified by the UK on the 17th of November 2016, seeks to strengthen the global response to climate change by holding the increase in global average temperature to two degrees above pre-industrial levels and by pursuing efforts to limit that increase to 1.5 degrees. On the 27th of June 2019, 
Section 1 of the Climate Change Act 2008 was amended to require the UK government to ensure that the net UK carbon account for 2050 is at least 100% lower than the baseline in 1990 for CO2 and other GHGs. This is known as the net zero duty. It replaced the previous requirement for an 80% reduction. On the 12th of December 2020, the UK committed to reducing national greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 by at least 68% compared to 1990 levels. The Climate Change Act establishes a framework of successive carbon budgets by which the UK may progress towards meeting its 2050 net zero target. The sixth carbon budget for the period 2033 to 2037 came into force on the 24th of June 2021. Although the UK has overachieved the first two carbon budgets and is on track to meet the third, the sixth carbon budget is the first to be based on the net zero target and the first to include emissions from international aviation and shipping attributable to the UK. The sixth carbon budget, to quote the court in the Friends of the Earth case, is substantially more challenging than those previously set. A quarter of the UK's total greenhouse gas emissions are attributable to the built environment. As the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee explained in their report, building to net zero, cost in carbon infrastructure on the 26th of May 2022, I'll call this the EAC report, embodied emissions from the demolition and construction of buildings amounts to some 40 to 50 million tonnes of CO2 annually, more than emissions from aviation and shipping combined. Significant carbon impacts will necessarily arise from the need to construct more homes to meet the national housing crisis. In the words of the EAC, finding the appropriate balance between demolition and new building versus reuse and retrofitting of existing buildings is crucial to a built environment policy which delivers sustainable outcomes. Considerable emissions are involved in demolition and rebuilding of properties, especially when measured under a whole life carbon approach. Under this approach, it becomes more debatable whether the replacement of properties is a sustainable approach to take. As the EAC report states in paragraph 72, if the UK continues to drag its feet on embodied carbon, it will not meet net zero or its carbon budgets. In section five of the EAC report, headed retrofit and reuse of existing buildings, the committee states, the construction, demolition and excavation sector is responsible for 62% of the total waste generated in the UK. It is estimated that 80% of buildings currently standing will still be in use in 2050. If the UK is to meet its net zero goals, the majority of these will require retrofitting to become energy efficient. There is a clear policy imperative to reduce the consumption of resources in the building and construction sector, to reduce waste material arising from demolition and replacement of existing properties, and to prioritise work to reduce emissions attributable to the built environment. The evidence we received consistently recommended that retrofit and reuse be prioritised over new build in order to conserve resources, reduce waste, minimise embodied carbon emissions, and provide a cost-effective solution to delivering on housing demands. The UK government's own submission to the inquiry stated that it understood the importance of properly accounting for carbon, which is why, to quote the government, we are promoting the benefits of reusing and retrofitting ahead of demolition. The committee received written evidence which presented a broad consensus that retrofit and reuse of existing properties was substantially more effective at conserving carbon than demolition and new build, even when the new construction used lower carbon materials. The EAC report even includes the MS scheme as, to quote, a case study on demolition and retrofit, which, quote, brings the debate regarding the environmental credentials of new build versus retrofit into public focus, end quote. 
in recognition of the global climate emergency and in order to enable the construction industry to meaningfully contribute to complying with the net zero obligation in section one of the climate change act the london plan 2021 and the westminster city plan 2021 contain crucial policies supported by supplemental guidance directed at promoting the circular economy minimizing greenhouse gas emissions the effects of climate change and prioritizing the reuse and retrofit of existing buildings over their demolition while the adoption of such policies by the mayor of london and westminster city council is laudable they have been misapplied in this case this scheme presented an ideal opportunity to showcase what these policy policies could achieve and that opportunity has been missed by the mayor and the council Dave will in due course invite the inspector to recommend to the Secretary of State that this scheme is not consistent with the UK's transition to a carbon neutral economy and not compliant with relevant sustainability policies. Turning finally to the planning balance, one could readily understand the temptation to override the initial embodied carbon cost if the buildings in question were causing significant heritage harm or structurally unsound. But the existing buildings in this case are respectively 92, 49 and 42 years old. There is no fundamental structural facade deterioration or safety reason why these buildings should be demolished. They are fully viable carbon assets. Furthermore, quite apart from causing heritage harm, Orchard House is itself a non-designated heritage asset that would be totally lost if demolished. It also contributes to the significance of des designated heritage assets, most notably Selfridges. SAVE does not dispute that there is much to like about the scheme, especially the operational energy efficiency credentials of the new build. <laughs> However, there is no reason why a perfectly feasible refurbishment cannot be undertaken and still achieve the legitimate objectives of increasing energy efficiency, improving the retail space, public realm enhancements, and introducing high quality offices. All of this can be realized without the huge embodied carbon cost of the proposed scheme. Despite claiming that sustainability is at the core of their plan and committing to be a net zero business by 2040, MS have dismissed the creative refurbishment alternative to such an extent, they have made a threat to the Secretary of State to leave Orchard House altogether if they do not get their way. This is not the constructive attitude of a retailer dedicated to sustainability, heritage conservation, and the future success of Oxford Street. Safe submission will be that there is a compelling case against knocking these buildings down. Added to this, the new building as proposed will harm the significance of designated heritage assets, including Selfridges next door. In relation to the policies of the London plan and city plan, they will give evidence of the scheme that does not comply with the following policies. London plan policy D3, the most appropriate form of development is a comprehensive refurbishment rather than demolition and new build. The development fails to respond to the existing character of the place and utilise the heritage assets that contribute towards the local character. London Plan Policy HC1. The scheme harms rather than conserves the significance of heritage assets. London Plan Policy SI2. MS has not adequately demonstrated by reference to their whole life carbon assessment that, as required by London Plan guidance, which informs how to assess an application under Policy SI2. The retention of existing built structures for reuse and retrofit has been prioritised and fully explored before considering substantial demolition. MS have failed to demonstrate that the benefits of demolition would clearly outweigh the benefits of retaining the existing buildings. London Plan Policy SI7. The scheme does not promote a more circular economy and minimise waste because as required by London Plan guidance, which informs how to assess an application on the policy SI7, it does not prioritise and robustly explore the reuse of the existing buildings 
in a comprehensive retrofit scheme. City Plan Policy 36. The scheme does not minimise the effects of climate change by utilising every opportunity to reduce emissions and has failed to properly consider a proposal for sensitive refurbishment and retrofitting of energy measures. City Plan Policy 38. The scheme does not optimise resource efficiency through refurbishment rather than demolition and rebuild and does not have regard to the character and appearance of the existing area, adjacent buildings and heritage assets. City Plan Policy 39. The scheme does not secure the, quote, conservation and continued beneficial use of heritage assets through their retention and sensitive adaptation, which will avoid harm to their significance while allowing them to meet changes, changing needs and mitigate and adapt to climate change. It does not ensure heritage assets and their settings are conserved and enhanced in a way, in a manner appropriate to their significance. It does not maintain the unique character of Westminster's heritage assets or enhance their settings and does not preserve or enhance the character and appearance of Westminster's conservation areas. It also does not concern the non-designated heritage asset of Orchard House. Finally, City Plan Policy 40. The development is not sensitively designed, having regard to the surrounding town space. Although there are many ways in which the scheme complies with development plan policies, the conflicts identified above are so significant that the inspector will be invited to conclude that the scheme fails to accord with the development plan taken as a whole, and no material considerations would justify a departure. Applying the balance in paragraph 202 of the framework, the less than substantial harm to multiple heritage assets is not outweighed by the scheme's public benefits. There is also the total loss of Orchard House, which must be weighed in the planning balance under paragraph 203 of the framework. The scheme also breaches paragraph 152 of the framework, under which the planning system should support the transition to a low carbon future by encouraging the reuse of existing resources, including the conservation of existing buildings. So, sir, in conclusion, you will in due course be asked to recommend the Secretary of State that the application be refused. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. So, turning to other people who wish to speak, um, one gentleman has to leave early for a COVID vaccination. So, can I invite you to speak first? Pop out of the door and come around this way. Come around that yeah. way. Come on the trip over wires. And have you got copies there? I don't know. I've only got one copy. Okay, well, perhaps you could pass it to someone to copy later on. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. It just saves you tripping over the wires. Yes, that's so right. Yeah, one <laughs> Take a seat. Um, my name is Charlie Baxter. I'm a local developer in Westminster of numerous buildings. Um, and thank you for the opportunity also of being able to speak now and also bring forward uh, my statement. I'm speaking in support of retaining and retrofitting Orchard House on environmental grounds. I welcome the government's public inquiry to investigate the applicants' claims that their proposal will create a net carbon positive building. I think that's highly unlikely when you consider the impact of the demolition into the equation. Being a developer of several award-winning buildings in Westminster, I have often had to make challenging decisions about what's best for the environment and what's best for profits. It has not always been easy, and planning policies do not protect those of us looking to make the most best sustainable choices, nor do they penalise those looking to take shortcuts. In fact, the Westminster planning system relies on applicants and their consultants being honest with their submissions. Planning officers are short-staffed 
and some applicants are aware that they do not have the resources to double check every statement made. It is with the benefit of this knowledge and experience that I object to the applicant's claim, which is at odds with everything I've learned about sustainable development. And this is not just me. The RIBA, the RICS, and the Royal Academy of Engineers have all denounced the unnecessary demolition of some 50,000 buildings a year in the UK, producing 126 million tonnes of waste, which represents two thirds of the country's total waste. Buildings should be preserved and repurposed whenever possible, the RIBA says. In the face of the climate emergency, we must rethink our disposable attitude to buildings. I fully understand that demolition and new build is easier than retrofitting an existing building, but it is beyond time for us to put the environment above profits. And what better way to draw a line in the sand than for the planning inspectorate and Westminster City Council to lead the way here by stopping this unnecessary demolition. MNS's destructive plans would release about almost 40,000 tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere immediately through the demolition of the existing building and raw materials used to build the new one. Carbon emissions emitted today have a larger impact compared to those released in the future such as through a building's ongoing use. This is because today's emissions are in the atmosphere and contributing to global warming for longer. Therefore, major new sources of emissions, such as the construction of this proposed new scheme, are particularly damaging. The applicant's architect argues, we're trying to deliver a Tesla here. But following that same analogy, it's more sustainable to convert gas guzzlers than to scrap them in preference for shiny new electric vehicles. And although Teslas may look nicer than some older vehicles, if we are to live up to our stated claim to be world leaders on achieving carbon zero, then we must consider what's best for the environment in every decision. It is no wonder that MNS's demolition plan caused such a huge public outcry. It contradicts local and national environmental policy commitments. MNS trades on its sustainability credentials, and these proposals fly in the face of its own Plan A net zero pledge. And they certainly fly in the face of Westminster City Council's net zero targets. The IPC 2022 report makes it clear that we must immediately and dramatically cut carbon emissions if we are to stand any chance of keeping global overheating to within two degrees. There is less than 10% chance of us keeping it to within 1.5 degrees. We can already see the devastating impact of 1.1 degrees. With public trust in large-scale development at only 2%, it is essential the government also drives greater accountability from applicants for the energy statements they make. At the moment, an applicant is able to submit factually incorrect energy statements with no impunity at all. I'm not saying this applicant has submitted a factually incorrect statement. This public inquiry will determine what has happened in this case. What I am saying is that there, this has certainly happened on other applications and needs to be stamped out vigorously. You cannot submit a tax return without consequence for mistakes that advantage your tax position. It is a criminal offence. The same should apply for misleading on carbon emissions. In summary, it is time for the government and Westminster City Council to push applicants to step up to the plate and encourage them, forcefully if necessary, to make choices that are best for the environment. And that means retrofitting and not demolition. The public have had enough and deserve better.
better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you happy to leave that to the top, please? Yeah, sure. Okay. Do, do and you've already given me the contact details for that, are you? Uh, that's all right. right. Okay. I'll be done. Yeah. <laughs> right, so um, moving on, Eric Reynolds. Uh, Julia Benfield. <laughs> Have you managed to get yours copied? Yes or not? Yes, I have. Yeah. Would you like to circulate? Yes. Oh, Good morning, and thank you for um, allowing me to say a few words. I am Julia Barfield, Managing Director of Mark Barfield Architects and one of the initiators of Architects Declare. We're probably best known as architects and entrepreneurs behind Mount and I and Bright and I 360, but among other projects that we've designed, we've also done the Cambridge Central Mosque, which was shortlisted for the Sterling Prize last year, um, as well as having experience with deep retrofit of substantial buildings in the West End. So I think there's a pattern emerging here. I, I think we can all agree that this morning that we're in a planetary emergency. Westminster Council, the GLA, the UK government and governments throughout the world have all declared. The science is clear and it's the science that we need to focus on here. The IPCC report told us in 2018 that we have 12 years to avoid an, an um, environmental catastrophe. And we see growing evidence all around the world that it's happening now, in some cases faster than scientific predictions. With floods, droughts, fires, melting, ice caps, I think all of uh, Europe's major city rivers this summer were in that 500 year lows. I mean, it's happening, it's happening now. What I think is an issue at this inquiry is, are we acting as if there's an emergency? And in my view, throwing a huge carbon bomb unnecessarily into the atmosphere, as this project proposes to do, is definitely not acting like there's an emergency. It misunderstands the urgency of our situation. And what science tells us is that what we do in the next eight years is absolutely critical. As architects, we're trained to take a brief from our client, to come up with the best design response. And the brief here was clearly to maximize the site potential. And the architects have built that bridge very well, I think, creating a building that minimizes operational carbon that five years ago would have been considered fine. Mm. However, now that we understand the upfront impact of embodied carbon, it really isn't. Um, with the demolition and particularly the building of two extra basements, because they are the worst in terms of embodied carbon. Everything needs to change given the emergency that we find ourselves in. And as architects, I believe we also have a higher responsibility to the planet as well as to our clients. As do the clients, by the way. And it's disappointing that one of the country's best loved retailers appears not to be taking the lead on climate. Conversely, if the brief to the design team had been to maximise the site's potential within the constraints of retrofit, I'm sure the team would have done a great job and MS could have demonstrated true climate leadership. It's entirely possible to successfully retrofit existing buildings. We found while doing a deep, deep, a deep retrofit ourselves on three buildings into one, including a 1930s building, that we were able to successfully radically transform them into high quality contemporary workspace. Obviously, every building is unique, but surely a deep retrofit needs to be properly tested in this instance. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming here. I forgot to, Mr. Harris, give you an opportunity to ask any questions. Don't, don't worry, sir. Um, 
uh, I, I would have asked if I, I I'm sure you would. Uh, and uh, you'll appreciate that we don't accept this, but this, the whole debate will be carried on at the inquiry and there will be formal cross-examination, which um, they will uh, yeah. assist you. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I've got copies here. So, um, moving on. Dr. Chris, I can't read my own writing here. Whitman. Whitman. <clears throat> Sir, um, Mr. Reynolds is also returned. Ah, okay. Thanks. Right. Well, I don't mind which of you gentlemen come first. Yeah, yeah, I've put it down. I did pass a copy to you. Yes. And the cox. Yes. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I am Dr. Chris Whitman, uh, a senior lecturer at the Welsh School of Architecture at Cardiff University. I have over 20 years of architectural practice in academia, uh, and I'm currently course director of the MSc in Sustainable Building Conservation. I am, however, here today in my role as signatory and coordinator of Heritage Declares Climate and Ecological Emergency. We are a non-affiliated group of heritage practitioners who have come together to urge the sector to react more quickly and effectively to the climate and ecological emergency. We are current counterparts to groups such as Architects Declares, and Engineers Declare, of which the architects and engineers of the proposal are signatories and work together with these organisations to achieve common goals. Since the launch of our 10 point declaration in 2019, 55 heritage organisations and 311 individuals have signed. We do not have the time to cover all 10 points here, however, I would like to take the first four which are most relevant to this inquiry. We seek to be a platform for change by using our position to tell the truth about climate and ecological emergency, promote environmental awareness and action, and foster the cultural changes that are required in the light of the immense challenges ahead. We declare to shift conservation priorities by actively seeking out opportunities to adapt heritage sites so as to reduce the carbon footprint and promote biodiversity without harming their cultural significance. We wish to build and share the evidence by seeking a fuller understanding of the intersection between cultural heritage and the environment, promoting rigorous open source research into carbon reduction climate adaptation and biodiversity in heritage contexts. And perhaps most pertinent to today, we declare to conserve embodied resources by bringing whole life carbon and energy efficiency mm. analysis to bear on the choices we make and the causes we support. For instance, by advocating an evidence-based policy of retaining, maintaining, repairing and adapting existing buildings whatever their formal heritage values, as an alternative to wasteful cycles of demolition. In July of this year, we organised a webinar in support of SAVE's campaign against the demolition of, this, of uh, these buildings, for which 211 registered to attend, predominantly from the UK, but also with representation from across Europe. We concur with the report prepared by Sturgis that the proposed demolition and rebuild are contrary to the National Planning Policy, the London Plan and the Westminster City Council Planning Policy. They do not address the current climate emergency and result in the loss of a prominent non-designated heritage asset. We agree with Historic England that the proposed redevelopment would result in harm to the setting of the Grade 2 Selfridges and to the heritage of the UK's primary retail street. Moreover, we want to reiterate the already mentioned RIBA 
2030 Climate Challenge Checklist, which calls for the prioritization of the refurbishment and retrofit of existing buildings where possible. Historic England research has demonstrated that substantial savings in operational carbon emissions can be made through well-considered retrofit, and that the speed at which carbon savings are made has a significant impact on addressing the climate emergency. This speed is vitally important, as the International Panel on Climate Change later report states that carbon emissions must peak by 2025. We have studied the proof of evidence provided by the architects. <clears throat> Whilst we agree further information has been provided on the retrofit options explored in section four, we are still of the opinion that the exploration was biased in favour of new build, and there has not been sufficient investigation of how the existing buildings might be reconfigured to provide the desired public benefits and commercial requirements. Rather, the work undertaken consistently sets out to prove they cannot. Given the experience of the architects in extensive remodelling, as demonstrated at their project in Kensington, which I understand you will be visiting, the options for refurbishment appear tentative. On a positive note, their report concludes that selective demolition could provide the same servicing solution as the proposed new build, and that the new services and upgrades of the facades could yield better operational carbon characteristics. We would add to this that the public realm improvements in the creation of the Granville Place Garden, the widening of Orchard Street pavements and the east-west permeability are all feasible with retrofit. That ceiling heights could be addressed through the introduction of double height spaces or atrium. That the claimed limited lifespan of the existing buildings can be addressed through retrofit. That selective demolition could provide an improved setting to Hesketh House, and that the creative remodeling or replacement of the Neil House and 23 Orchard Street facades could create a harmonious composition, achieving the desired identity for Marks and Spencers, one that is more consistent with their Plan A sustainability policy. In short, we believe that the site offers an excellent opportunity for the retailer to commission a high quality, world leading retrofit thereby demonstrating its commitment to tackling the climate emergency. Commitments to a transition to a circular economy and prioritising the reuse of our built environment have been made in writing by Westminster, London, the UK and the UN. However, we have yet to see much in the way of practical application of these policies. Climate change cannot be addressed through words alone. These must be put into action. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, Eric Lennox is the, on his way here. Mr. Reynolds, yes. <laughs> Good morning, sir. I'm Eric Reynolds and wish to address you on the matter of Marks and Spencer in Oxford Street. I have 49 years experience of urban regeneration projects in the UK and the USA. My company, Urban Space Management, has often, working in joint venture with others, including Sainsbury's, another well-known retailer, uh, the Spitfields Development Group, UK Land and others, uh, taken redundant commercial and retail buildings and refurbished and remodeled them to suit alternative commercially successful projects. Examples include a Grade 1 uh, listed railway station in Bath, many high street stores and major market buildings such as Spitalfields on the edge of the City of London. I've been an advisor to local and central government uh, and recently, for example, I served uh, on Sir John Timpson's High Street report. I've worked as a developer and manager of places of public resort, uh, which have clocked up over 12 million visitors annually. But I know a bit about people places and places that people 
want to be. In general, people want to be where people are. Um, for personal expression and professional experience, I question the suggestion that demolition and replacement of existing buildings is the only solution. It would appear that the driving force is to build a larger building with potentially greater retail and rental value with a smaller MS or other retailer unit attached. There are many examples of successful updating and improvement of existing buildings, including the one in which we sit today. This has restricted headroom, but I think most of you would agree that this is a perfectly pleasant place to be working. There are also many examples of reuse. Uh, for example, uh, Smithfields, where we've all been involved for some 12 or 14 years. The general market and poultry market survived two attempts by local authority supported developers to demolish. And they are now to reopen as the Museum of London. Admittedly, with a, a large amount of money expended to make that change, but nevertheless, those buildings were decided not to be the, the, the only solution this demolition, which the Corporation of London had thought it was. In the case before we, the aim seems to be simply to make a larger building around the side. This larger building would, in all probability, make significantly more money uh, as a property development than ever as a flagship store. As we all know, once demolished, a building is very rarely replace life to life. There are, however, examples of demolition sites that remain empty for a considerable time. We're living at the moment in, in fairly strange times and it's possible that, that investment views change over a reasonably short time horizon. However, there are signs um, that uh, things are moving Retail is a volatile sector, but sometimes the flow, including not expensive, has been to out of town and edge of town location with good car parking, as for example at Westfield, where MS do figure. However, there are now signs that some retail is returning to the country and that alternative operators do exist. IKEA, for example, uh, until recently exclusively operating out of town, are now moving back to town and indeed to Oxford Street. There's no guarantee uh, that an MS will trade. I don't doubt that they are a highly reputable organisation. There can be no guarantee that they will trade forever from a new, albeit far smaller, store. We can, however, easily imagine the dust, noise and destruction, the restriction of pavements and roads, and that the demolition and construction period will bring to the area. We're told it's a fragile area that will be even more fragile during that possibly six years. The current low quality of retail alongside the Minimum's flagship store might in part be due to the short term leases that might have been offered in order to preserve the vacant possessions that development would require. So it's possible that the buildings have in fact been, as it were, run down. It might be that the current state of buildings and the type of tenant has something to do with the lack of investment by the landlord, understandably, in preparation for the clearing out of the spaces to enable demolition. It might therefore be the case that if the running down had not been the order to pay, and if the investments had been made in the normal uh, stages, as all uh, property owners and landlords do, uh, that the demolition would not today have been the top of the MS agenda. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I mean, Thank you for your efforts. Far from the farm. So, could we? Uh, one of our one of the third parties has got to go. So, David Kuchli, he's already. Thanks. Is that right? That he goes next. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much. Who's that? David Coffey. So, do you have a copy of the uh, principal energy statement? I do, yes. I'll check with the next thing to Emma. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave them all here. Yeah. You can check through the one. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Anna. The Hands of West, of uh, course, mainline, Avanti. Um, 
I'm not terribly reliable and I have to catch a train to Glasgow. Um, right. So, would you mind if I stand? I'm not in the slide. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm an architect. I, I live in London, but fortunately, I've had a career that's taken me all around the world. I've been in many cities around the world. So, I'm taking a more of an overview of, of this. I mean, clearly, there are many complex issues associated with this uh, proposal, and they're very fully dealt with, I have to say. Uh, by, by the applicant, but there are also other considerations as well. And uh, there's that old adage that a complex problem has a simple solution. It has to be clear, it has to be straightforward, but it is not always correct. Sometimes it's wrong. Therefore, it's very important that we look at these questions, and that's why I'm backing the SAFE campaign to open up the debate for all the issues that have been been raised. Oxford Street is actually one of London's iconic cities. And all cities around the world have their own characteristics. And uh, the retail in Oxford Street has actually declined. We know that. But nevertheless, it's still there. And uh, one little bit I put in my, my evidence here is that I was passing along there on the bus recently. An American tourist said to his wife, Gee, we're going to have to get off because they're about to demolish Marks and Spencers. Yeah, but I do wonder, is the attraction, is it actually Marks and Spencers offering? Or is it in fact a building? Orchard House is very much a building of its time and place in the development of that part of London and the retail offering it has. I think it's an extremely important building. And I wouldn't like to see it demolished, I have to say. And I just wonder if the new build, certainly the photographs that I've looked and studied, is a better replacement. Or could that building, that new building, be actually in Chicago or Dubai or many other cities around the world? Certainly one of the things that worries me as an architect, and a small point, Orchard House knows how to turn the corner into Orchard Road from Oxford Street. In other words, the very corner of the building is extremely important. Edwardian architecture, Victorian architecture, knew how to do that. Architects today seem to have lost that. I don't think this building turns the corner very well. It's a very sharp turnaround. So I can't say that I think the new building is a very good replacement for the old building. I'm not getting into the issues of carbon because they've been well rehearsed and well spoken about. But one of the things I will say, because I was an architect of London Transport at one point, that I knew the difficulties of building a new station or making alterations or so on. And that was the thing called muck away. In other words, how do you get all that stuff that you've got to get out of the centre of London away? A building of this size, if it's demolished, is going to cause a huge environmental problem in the area and traffic hazards and problems to other shops in the area, like Selfridges and next to them, and the whole of Oxford Street. Well, people come to Oxford Street. Now, London needs that retail offering. It needs that for its revenue. And I think it would be a shame to lose that for a temporary or a permanent position. Um, I think it's possible. I do think it's possible. That at least Orchard House, which I know better than the other buildings around it, the two other buildings, could be reimagined, could be refitted, could be brought up to a modern standard. Instead of which, what's being proposed to me is actually an office block. An office block with some retail. Okay, will Marks and Spencer continue retail even in the new store? Who's to tell? Retail is changing all the time. So I think it's a danger of just falling into this because there's a lot of evidence to say it's a good idea. Is it a good idea? Complex problems are always correct. And therefore, I would say, if we could think of a solution that kept the external envelope, which is an extremely well-recognized face in Oxford Street, and dealt with the interior, that would be a solution. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs> Safe journey. Thank you. Yeah, 
There's Barbara McFarland on her way around. Yeah. And then Jessica Tool after. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, uh, we're from the Architects Climate Action Network, um, a network of built environment professionals um, <coughs> called ACAN. Our contribution to the inquiry is from the point of view of climate change and the climate emergency. Other groups will and have made representation about the effects of the loss of the historic building. <coughs> we agree that the report on <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> we agree that the report of the uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this year uh, said that the next few years are critical. They said, in the scenarios we assess, limiting warming to around 1.5 degrees C requires global greenhouse gas emissions to peak before 2025 at the latest and be reduced by 43% by 2030. The IPCC also states, Without immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees C is beyond reach. Given the urgent need to curb emissions in the face of time and climate emergency, the high quality retrofitting of an existing building is a better solution than knocking it down and rebuilding it. The whole life carbon assessments that developers use when building new buildings are an evolving, evolving, complex and imperfect science. They aim to look at CO2 emissions released by the mining production, the transportation of building materials, as well as the CO2 emissions from future operational use. Therefore, we would argue that it is worse to demolish and rebuild now, which would emit tons of CO2 now rather than half a century from now when we might have better technology for absorbing CO2 emissions. For these reasons we think that a viable refurbishment exists and can be found. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, just before you go, a very pedantic point on, on my part that I want to record it correctly. Yeah. Is, is the apostrophe in the right place? Oh, yes. Not. <laughs> Shall I, shall I also? Yeah, it's one of my weak points. Yes. Do right well, I, I don't want to repeat an error. <laughs> <laughs> Someone might think it was mine. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we... Just to tell the board councillor on right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Toll, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the session today, I'm one of the local ward councillors in the West End. And it's in this capacity that I'm speaking today, uh, as well as being a local resident in Westminster. Now, Oxford Street runs through my ward. It is the artery that connects our surrounding villages of Soho, Mayfair, Fitzrovia and Marlebone. Being, being a councillor of the West End has made me acutely aware of the fine balance that's needed to meet the real needs of this unique ecosystem and to allow it to thrive. Now, that means balancing the needs of residents, visitors and businesses in the area and also the role it plays as a home, a leisure destination and an economic powerhouse in the UK. I understand deeply the importance of getting the balance right between respecting our past and also serving the needs of a changing city. And if we look to define what healthy urban development looks like today, it's a future which inevitably includes a commitment to addressing the climate emergency and reducing our carbon impact. 
and this is why I've supported the decision to call in this planning application. And I've uh, and urged the planning inspector to reconsider the application on the grounds of heritage preservation and sustainability. Now, as a community, a community of architects, planners, businesses, residents, councillors, we've long understood the importance of buildings whose value lie in the character that they lend to an area. And its character is what is part of what makes London an attractive destination to people around the world. Now, the beauty of the MS building and Orchard House in particular lies in its restrained classicism, characteristic of the era, era in which it was built, and its complementarity to the Grade 2 star listed Selfridges building just next door. It's also visible from many areas within the various conservation areas listed earlier today, and a strong case could be made for its inclusion within these conservation zones. Plans to demolish and replace this building would disrupt its contiguous relationship with Selfridges and also be a considerable loss to the UK's 20th century architectural heritage. It's a building that's been characteristic of Oxford Street for almost 100 years, and I would wager that the architects who built it thought it might be there for quite a bit longer. Um, and it's well loved by the community. So in my view, it should be preserved for future generations of residents, visitors, and employees on Oxford Street to enjoy. Now we've heard a lot about the environmental impacts to demolish the building and these are considerable both in terms of the wasted embedded carbon and the carbon used to rebuild the new building <coughs> and given the UK's national commitments to achieving net zero, the Greater London Authority's stated policy to prioritise retrofit and the climate emergency we face globally, significant efforts should be made to mitigate carbon emissions. I support the conclusion of Simon Sturgis' report commissioned by Save Britain's Heritage calling for alternative plans that include a comprehensive retrofit of the building on this site, which I don't believe are necessarily suboptimal. And this approach could set new precedents for dealing with heritage assets across UK cities, both preserving their character and contributing to our climate goals. Now, Max and Spencer's, as we've heard, is a flagship British brand that trades off its heritage value and its sustainability credentials. It has a unique opportunity to demonstrate that these values are not simply window dressing, but they're embedded in all of its operations, including its commercial portfolio strategy. MS could set an example for other owners, occupiers, and investors across the country by demonstrating leadership in the reuse and retrofit of heritage assets rather than holding the community to ransom with threats to abandon the site. In the process, it could also make a significant contribution to the UK's climate goals. I'd also like to take this opportunity to call on the building industry to apply its will and expertise more broadly to embrace the challenge of reusing and adapting existing structures to new needs. Now, it's for all of these reasons I've just stated that I wholeheartedly support the efforts to ensure that this, this building is retained and retrofitted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have copies though? Um, I have emailed and I also have emailed them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did anyone else wish to speak today? Yes, gentleman at the back. <laughs> well done. Okay. I don't think I caught your name. Keith, Keith Howard. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name's Keith Howard. I have submitted a uh, made submission to the uh, hearing prior to this. Fabulous. I just wanted to respond to, to some of the in support of my assertions. Um, just to start off with, just it's only three points. Um, during the presentation from the council, from the applicant, it was sort of uh, slipped in that if the re if the demolition was not permitted, then uh, MS would vacate that site and not continue to retail at that place. Um, and in doing so, it would 
uh, did diminish the footfall of Oxford Street in that end of, uh, of Oxford Street and Marble Arch End. Um, just to give you an idea, the store right now is what uh, my uh, m and called a full service store. It sells clothing, uh, house, houseware and food. And to put that in perspective, the m and current um, annual report states that 66% of m and revenue comes from food, 33% comes from houseware and clothing and so forth. So the big money owner is food. So when the, uh, the council for the applicant was saying if um, m and closed their full service store, as they call it, uh, th th this would have a devastating effect on the retail. I, I personally thought that was staggeringly pompous. Because let's uh, be true, if anyone knows Oxford Street, I've lived in London most of my life, the big store there is Selfridges, thanks to Gordon Selfridge, hence all the references to Chicago. Um, I think if M&S were to vanish today, there would be almost negligible difference in footfall. People come to Selfridges and all the other stores, and if you look at those other stores, um, they're mostly upmarket. We have, a, we have a little Bond Street development going on in that portion of Oxford Street. And in fact, uh, the closure of the m and operation at the Marble Arch store, when the gentleman made the comment, I'll be honest, I wrote in my book, good, because I think it would vacate the site for a more meaningful, up-to-date, creative retailer that's better fitting to that part of the now upmarket Oxford Street that we know. For example, on the far side, if you look at, imagine yourself looking at Selfridges on the right hand side, uh, who has moved into the store as is, no demolition required, Hugo Boss, very upmarket haute couture German uh, clothing manufacturer. They know the value of being next to the big store that matters, Selfridges. So I imagine if M&S packed up their a kit and left today, I would imagine there would be all sorts of stores would be falling over each other to move into that store as is unchanged. Think of a name, Louis Vuitton, Dior, Under Armour, because Adidas and Nike have uh, stores already. They would delight in the Art Deco uh, building as is and dress it up and it would look just uh, magnificent on that corner clinging to the left side of Selfridges. And in fact, the closure of m and full service stores, as I, as I wrote down in my book, good. Um, it's not just my nasty opinion, uh, the words of Marks and Stences themselves. Press release, October the 12th, 2022, what's that, 12 days ago, they plan to close 67 of their full service stores and open 104 Simply Food stores. Good on m and it's finally got through that their big revenue is food and having to maintain gigantic stores like the one at Marble Arch selling clothing and household goods is a loser. And they finally twigged it. So when the gentleman said they're going to close it, it may well be in their plan to do so anyway, because there's 67 other stores in other cities that are going to lose their big stores, but they will gain, hooray for us, because I like m and food, m and Simply Food stores. So I think the closure is not a threat. When I heard it, I thought, good, they finally learned their business, m and have learned their business model, and they're going to move out and leave the beautiful building as is for a new creative retailer to move in. A good example of that on Oxford Street is Nike Town at Oxford Circus. In that beautiful circus that was designed by John Nash, when Topshop went out of business, what happened? Nike moved in. No demolition, of course, there's no way, no way this side of Christmas that anyone would allow them to demolish a piece of Oxford Circus. They moved in inside the shell of the building that have created a fabulously commercially successful operation. And I submit that's exactly what could happen at Orchard House. With the right retail, with the right product set, they could make that an absolutely fabulous store and keep the beautiful ambience of that particular corner. 
And, and just uh, the other point in closing then was this, co uh, this comrade's continuous interest in spatial land, making the most of the space. Well, making the best use of space it surely cannot be the uber rationale for everything. Otherwise, every booty, the full length of Bond Street should be demolished and we can put a Westfield there. Two of them, one each side of the street. Boy, that would be really uh, beneficial spatial use of Bond Street instead of all those itsy bitsy little boutiques each with their own heating in it. But of course, that's not the way our wonderful emotional world works, is it? We respond. Visitors, Londoners, global visitors respond. They come to see all our beautiful architecture. And that, that particular corner, I, I'm not against demolition per se, but that you go stand in that corner, self produced. You've got the beautiful buildings where William Morris, the wonderful uh, artist, had his first shop on Oxford Street. It's practically still there. Selfridges, of course, Orchard House, and now that, well, that's what it would look like. That sort of boat modern building where Zara has the corner slot. Uh, no one comes to see office blocks and all. They come to see the Orchard House. They come to see Selfridges. They relish in that beautiful architectural place. And that is why I just wanted to sit my, my thoughts in favour of preserving the building. Thank you very much. Have you left any notes that you've got? Uh, I had this. I was also, if you want to transfer it, I can give that to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Oh, sorry, did you? You're all right. Yes, I'm fine. Anyone else wish to speak today? Right. Okay. In that case, um, in the moment, we'll adjourn and I'll make arrangements for this afternoon's site visit. And we'll then resume at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I know there's at least one person who wants to speak at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then we'll hear from the first. So uh, that only leaves the, the site visit. Who wants to uh, um, attend from the applicants? Um, I am not entirely sure. I'm sh sh sure for certain that um, Mr. Pilgrim will be there. Right. And um, I think Dr. Mide as well. And uh, um, I think a representative from Deep Nine in place of um, Mr. Goddard. Okay. I've not been nominated who that is unless they put their hand up. No, no. And from the same. So it's going to be Mr. Forshaw for the whole of the accompanied side visit and Mr. Sturgis just for the other side of the building. Okay. And did anyone want to come from this transfer? Sir, I will be attending from the council, Matthew Pendleton. And yeah, I intend to come as well, sir. Right, uh, so where, when shall we meet? Shall we meet at about quarter past, quarter past two? And which end, which end are we starting from? We need to look at the interior first, sir. So, so we'll we start yeah. on the corner of the outside of Richard House. Is it safe to stand on the corner there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, uh, so we'll aim to be there about and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. I think, so. you're going to look at the interior of the, the, the store in the local context outside. For your convenience, we've prepared a selection of the HTPIA views in the little booklet. I have 10 copies, so if that's useful, I can definitely useful. And if there are any other viewpoints that um, people want me to look at, I won't bring uh, my laptop, so if you can bring hard copies of anything that you want me to see in right. Um and we're roughly following this map, are we? That was sent. Yes, yes. Yes. And then off to Kensington High Street, and then off to Kensington High Right. Okay. So um, for those of you, we'll we'll meet at quarter past two on the corner of Orchard House. For everyone else, we'll resume here at ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Until then, the inquiries are Thank you very much. Thank you. And you. Thank you very much.
Could I have one story? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 